Hi, my name is Ashley and welcome back to my channel. I know some people here on YouTube have extensive lists of how they got into multiple universities, but I applied early decision to Columbia University because I knew that it was my dream school. Today, I'm going to be discussing something that I have put off for quite a while now, revealing my high school college admission statistics feels invasive. Like that one time my friend told me after graduation that he had hacked into the school's computer system and knew my GPA and class rank the entire time. I think that everyone has a different college admissions journey. I'm also a tour guide for my school. So sometimes when people ask me like, what is your specific GPA and SAT? I find it a little bit funny because um, Columbia University does publish top SAT, 50% mark SAT, what's scoring in the 75th percentile, and you can sort of gauge how likely you are to get in through that. What I found most helpful over YouTube videos, because everyone has unique circumstances, is looking at more big picture. What does the entire class of Columbia look like as opposed to just one person? Well, as opposed to making this video about what I did to quote unquote deserve going to Columbia University, I think that it would be really important to start out with a lot of the other external factors that I had no control over that helped me get into Columbia University. And there are a lot of internal politics and things going on that as a 18 year old you are subject to. And I wanted to give you some quick statistics on it. My personal experience at Columbia was that probably around half of my friends and colleagues went to private school, I, but only 10% of students in the United States go to private school. So well, automatically you are vying for 50% when you are 90% of the population. The year I graduated was actually the year of the 2020 census and so I found the number of graduating seniors the year that I graduated. That number is 3,209,510 students across the nation. So I went to US News pretty much among discourse that is a pretty reliable, reliable source for seeing what the best colleges are. So I added together the freshman class size of all 10 top universities. There were a few tied for number nine. So I added together the ones that had the highest class sizes just so that I would err on the side of being more gracious in this statistic that made for an incoming class size of around so every year only around are admitted to the top 10 universities even though there are 3 million graduating and that makes for a statistic of percent of students have the chance to attend a top 10 university. So that itself is a ridiculous statistic. I sort of from memory pieced together that of a graduating class size of around 500 students, each year my large public high school sends around five kids to a top 10 school. I and mean, this is pretty consistent. Sometimes the name of the school changes. So 1% of my school compared to Later on, I'll talk about my AP classes and I had access to those AP classes. I also had access to SAT prep and one thing that I kind of just forgot was the fact that I come from an extremely educated family. So why am I saying this? I'm saying this because if I were to fail, it would be me and the system behind me, which is enough money to pay for SAT prep and my activities and highly educated parents. And so that's a system of mine that succeeded. Some people, when they fail, it's a much larger monster of a machine behind them. But I know that there are some people when they fail, they feel like it's their fault and it's really not. Growing up, I had this myth of what it meant to win a war or work with people who are top of their field. But I've learned going to an Ivy League school that sometimes some students are handed these positions, that there is a lot of nepotism and money that even though it's not always as overt as the, for instance, Rick Singer case, it is something that happens all the time. An article that I wanted to link for you was an article by the New York Times. A lot of richer kids oftentimes have diagnoses for ADHD. And this is not to say that they don't have ADHD, but 
I know people who have had extended time not only in college exams, but also in their exams in high school, including the SAT. So I went to a large public high school with a graduating class of 500 students. By the time that I submitted my college applications, I was ranked 16 out of, I think like 490, something like that. And by the time I graduated, which colleges didn't see, I was ranked 21 because I decided to take an unweighted art class. I was able to get all A's throughout high school, but as for the exact weighted GPA, I didn't remember until I pulled up my baby resume from 2019 or something and I had a weighted 4.46 GPA. I'm going to give you my stats. So for SAT, I got a 1540. I got a 790 in my math and a 750 in English. I took two subject tests and to be honest, I was a little bit embarrassed by my second score. So for my math two test, I got an 800. And for my literature subject test, I got a 730, which is considered pretty low. <laughs> So AP scores, I'm just going to list my scores in order of my lowest to my highest scores. So I got a 3 in AP Physics C and also a 3 in AP European History, but when I took the AP European History test, I actually had, I was suffering from a string of three concussions. And then for AP scores, I'm a four. I have AP language, AP art history, and AP calculus BC, which my family kind of roasted me for. My mom was like, I got a five on my calc BC test, and that was in the 80s. So if that gives you any reference for what my family is like. And then finally, for the category of getting five on my AP test, I took AP microeconomics, AP statistics, AP US history, psychology, literature, and government. So those are the tests that I received a five on. Um, but I also thought it was important to note that in the category of extracurriculars, I did feel a little bit like a failure and I will put those in front of you. But if you look at my common app, Cut and Dry, you will probably think that I was pretty successful. I actually don't have my activities and awards list. I looked all over my room, my computer. The fact that in high school I placed so much weight on this compiled list of extracurriculars and I was really thinking about it and I couldn't really think of the last five. So number one, I was a figure skater for many years. For a while I was pouring my energy into doing a lot of technical competitions and then when I got injured and concussed I started sort of stopped working on a lot of the harder jumps and in fact it actually benefited my college admissions process and for instance I completed my tests so I was considered a US gold medalist and then again I sort of stopped competing and jumping but I ended up going to something called National Showcase. It was like a three hour drive and I placed seventh place and then so that encouraged me for the next year to try it again. I didn't do as well, but I was still considered a national US figure skating competitor. I had this deep fear that I was awful. The girl that I would see sometimes at the ice rink that my jump coach was at, she ended up being the youngest woman to ever win the US national title. So for reference against the people that I'm comparing myself, I really didn't feel that good. So my number two activity after figure skating was journalism. I did journalism all four years of high school. My freshman year, my brother, who was a year older than me, was was also in journalism and I petitioned to skip the regular journalism class and take advanced journalism. It was considered a class and so in my common app I was able in additional notes to say that a reason why my class rank and weighted GPA was just a little bit lower was because I did want to take this unweighted class all four years. To be honest if I could have it my way I also would have taken visual art but then my GPA just would have suffered so much so I will say that that if you are in the humanities or the arts, sometimes this whole statistics game doesn't really work in your favor just because the nature of art and writing classes being considered unweighted. It was also great because it was a way to win a lot of rewards and this itself is a huge privilege because some schools do not offer journalism and so what I will say about that is I think that they do have online journalism programs that you can be a part of and if you are a writer like me, which I'll get into, you can freelance stuff. I'll talk about things that I was able to do 
where I was able to write without exactly the backing of my school or a teacher. Through this program, um, let me pull up my LinkedIn because I actually still have this stuff on my LinkedIn. Through journalism, I was able to win a lot of awards. For example, I won California News Publer Association Individual Awards, first place enterprising news story, third and first and third place enterprising news story, uh, and fourth place twice in the category of columns. Those were my individual awards for journalism, but as a entire paper and club, we were also able to get other awards, such as the gold and silver crown award for hybrid and print news issued by the Columbia Scholastic Press Association. And so in order to do this, we had to be pretty active uploading things online. And I also was a co-host of a podcast for a while so that we could say that we had been involved in multiple different platforms. I believe the third thing that I put on my activities list was the fact that I went to creative writing camps. So the summer after sophomore year, I had a really transformative experience at Kenyan Young Writers Program. And my junior year, I actually didn't get into the one that I wanted to go to, which I will just plug because I still think it's a great program it's called Iowa Young Writers Studio. And that definitely looks good for the category of writing. So the summer after my junior year, I decided to go to a camp called For Acres in Portland, Oregon. It definitely wasn't my favorite and I would totally recommend Kenyan over that program but if it, you don't get in and you are trying to buy time and you still want to do something productive I would recommend that program so those were the top four I don't exactly remember the other ones but I was more loosely involved in things like dance tutoring, volunteering, and teaching the piano, but nothing that really stood out on a state and national level. So what I will say about activities is it's a little bit like stats in that you're trying to place yourself in a state and national conversation as opposed to one within your own high school. High school rivalry is a huge thing, you know, competing against your immediate peers, but you really have to think about college admissions and the fact that you are competing with people nationally and really also internationally. When I gave that statistic earlier, those were 3 million kids in the United States. I think at Columbia, we have a 20% maybe international population. And so if you can really obtain state and national titles, that is going to really help you in the long run. So for awards, I had two national scholastic medals. The first silver medal that I won was for flash fiction. And the second one that I won was for an entire portfolio of my essay, journalistic work, creative writing, and poetry. What I will say about the flash fiction piece is that even though I had been writing fiction for a really long time, so obviously there was some element of perfecting something behind it, the piece itself probably only took me an hour, two hours to write. At the time, you know, it feels like you're just sending work into a void, but if you keep sending it and keep sending it, there is going to be a time where something will stick. So this also happened to me with the New York Times. I ended up being a runner up in a contest of around a thousand kids. And at the time, it just felt like I was writing some commentary on whatever, but it was published, I believe. I think I had a link to it for a while. I think it's taken down, but at the time that I was applying to college, I was able to say, look, my name is in the New York Times. And I think that that is something that someplace like Columbia will really value is that even though you have opportunities within your own school and you're doing journalism within a school setting that you sort of achieve to put your name out there, especially within big organizations. And then for some of the more standard awards I won that weren't English specific was that I was an AP scholar with distinction and I was a National Merit Scholarship commended. I found this in my resume. I'm not sure. The other four I'm positive I put in my awards, but I also won my high school's English Departmental Award and also English Publication Departmental Award, so I might have also put those. I really hope that you enjoyed this video. If you are interested in more content by me, I have little bits of my life. Have a great day and happy college!